Hey, it's Alan, and today we are going to be reading Chapter 8, Two New Friends. In the summer between first and second grades, Zinkoff acquires two new friends. One is a baby sister. The other is a neighbor. The baby sister is Polly. The neighbor is Andrew. When Zinkoff first meets the baby, his mother says, look, and pulls down the blanket. Zinkoff's eyes boggle. There are two silver stars on the baby's diaper. This baby is one less than one day old. What can she have done already to deserve two stars? He's never been awarded more than one at a time. Mom, two stars? What did she do? She did the best thing of all, says his mother, pulling up the blanket. She was born. Has Zinka been misinformed? I was born too, wasn't I? She pats his hand. Absolutely. You were every bit as born as Polly. So, how come I didn't get two stars? Who says you didn't? He brightens. I did? She shakes her head. Sorry, I was kidding you. That was before I started giving out stars. Now she needs to pick him up again. I tell you what, how would you like your being born stars now? Better late than never. He brightens again. Yeah! But she's not finished thinking. Or well, how about this? We could make a deal. We could wait until you're having a really bad day. Some day when you could really, really use two stars to pick you up, and then that's when you get them. He thinks it over. He hates to wait, but he loves to make deals. Okay, he says, and shakes his mother's hand. Then he reaches into the blanket and shakes the baby's foot. A month later, the new neighbors move in next door. That same day, Mrs. Zinkoff bakes a strawberry angel food cake and carries it out to the front door. Her firstborn tags along. This is how we say welcome, she says. He stands at his mother's side as she rings the doorbell and says, welcome to the neighborhood and hands the cake to the new lady neighbor, whose proper name is Mrs. Orwell, but whose first name is much better, Sharice. Then he introduces himself. I'm Donald. Sharice smiles down at him and shakes his hand and says, hello, Donald, I have a son too. His name is Andrew. How old are you? Six, he replies. So is Andrew. Zinkoff stares at the two ladies in wonder. Wow! Same as me! He looks past Charisse. Is he in there? He is, says Charisse. But he's hiding. He says he's never coming out. He's mad because we moved away from our other house. Zinkoff thinks about this for a moment. He lifts a finger to Charisse. I have an idea. Uh, tell Andrew my father is a mailman. That, that will make him come out. In Zinkoff's view, carrying the mail is the most interesting job there is. Charisse nods solemnly. I'll give it a try. Before Zinkoff and his mother get back to their own house, he has another idea. I'm going to make a special welcome just for Andrew. Good for you, says his mother. A cake? Uh, no, no, a cookie. His mother does not say no. His parents try not to say no to him unless it's really necessary. So when he announces that he intends to bake a cookie, his mother simply says, what kind? He doesn't hesitate. A snickerdoodle. The snickerdoodle is his favorite cookie. Every cookie tastes good to him, but snickerdoodles taste twice as good because of their name. Sometimes his dad says snickerdoodle and it makes him laugh for an hour. Zinkoff's idea is to bake a snickerdoodle so big that Andrew, the new neighbor, will have to come out and see it. Since he is working on the kitchen table, it seems to him that the largest cookie he can make would one be one as large as the table itself. But his mother points out that a, ta a cookie that big could not fit into the oven. So he settles for a rectangular cookie that covers the entire cookie pan. Every time his mother tries to help, the young chef snaps at her, I can do that. So his mother simply gives him directions and says, Heaven help me, a lot, while her intrepid, wow, what a big word, intrepid, let's look that up, 
intrepid son makes a mess of the kitchen. Flour and eggs fly everywhere. For weeks to come, the family will feel the crunch of sugar grains underfoot. Finally, miraculously, the cookie gets baked. He snatches the quilted mitten and pot holder from his mother. I can do it myself. He pulls the hot pan from the oven and sets it on the kitchen table. Impatient as always, he cannot wait for it to cool. He blows over the steaming cookie <laughs> until he's out of breath. He flaps his hands over it. At last, the pan is cool enough to touch without the mitten. He runs next door with it. He rings the bell. Charisse opens the door. Hi, Donald. Hi, Charisse. I made a welcome cookie for Andrew. It's a snickerdoodle. I think if you put it on the floor and wait a little while, he'll smell it and come out. Zinkoff is utterly serious, but for some reason, Sharif laughs. Come on in, she says. Wait here. Charisse leaves him standing in the living room. He hears whispery voices upstairs. Once, he hears a sharp no. Then there are footsteps on the stairs. And here, at last, is Andrew Orwell walking towards him in his grumpy face in pajamas in the middle of the day. Hi, Zinkoff says. My name is Donald Zinkoff. I'm your neighbor. I, I made you a welcome cookie. It's a snickerdoodle. Andrew's face perks up. He leans in to smell the cookie. He is hooked. Zinkoff reaches for the spatula his mother told him to bring along. A cookie is not really a cookie until it's out of the pan and into your hand. So he lays the pan on the floor. He pries the giant snickerdoodle from the sides and the bottom of the pan. He lifts out the warm, soft, heavenly smelling welcome. He lifts it with both hands and holds it to Andrew. But as Andrew reaches for it, the panless, unsupported cookie collapses of its own weight and falls onto the floor. Andrew is left with scraps on the floor and he stares in horror as he screams, my cookie, you dropped it. He runs screaming up the stairs. I hate this place. Zinkoff stuffs one of the scraps into his mouth, then the other. He gathers up the collapsed pieces from the floor and carries them home in the pan. He sits on the front step. Everybody who passes by that afternoon is offered a piece of the cookie. In between, Zinkoff helps himself. By the time Clunker 4 rattles up to the curb, the cookie is gone. As his father gets out of the car, Zinkoff runs to him, plunges his head into his father's mailbag, and throws up. See, Zinkoff was born with an upside down valve in his stomach. This causes him to throw up several times a week. To Zinkoff, throwing up is almost as normal as breathing. But not to his father, who has brought his mailbag home with him in order to repair the strap. When Donald was an infant, Mr. Zinkoff was very good about changing his diapers. But he has no stomach for vomit. He turns away. He holds out the bag and growls, Take this to your mother! Early on, Zinkoff's mother impressed upon Donald the etiquette of throwing up. That is, do not throw up at random, but throw up into something, preferably a toilet or a bucket. Since toilets or buckets are not always handy, Zinkoff has learned to reach for the nearest container. Thus, at one time or another, he is thrown up into a soup bowl, a flower pot, wastebasket, trash bins, shopping bag, winter boots, kitchen sinks, and once a clown's hat but never his father's mailbag. He thinks his mother will say, heaven help me, but she does not. She's cool. She puts down baby Polly, unloads the bag into the toilet. She scours it with a stiff bristle brush and hand soap. Then she rubs it with Marley's leather cream. She sweetens it with a splash of Menon's aftershave and sets it into the playpen for baby Polly to crawl into. Hungry again, Zinkoff eats a full dinner that night and throws up into one of his socks. <sighs> Heaven help me. So that was chapter eight. We learned a lot more about Zinkoff. One, that he has an upside down stomach valve that makes him throw up a lot. And he throws up into a lot of different things. 
We also learned he now has a baby sister and a new neighbor named Andrew that maybe they'll become friends? Zinkoff brought him a big cookie and it crumbled to pieces on the ground and Andrew seemed to get upset about that. But maybe they'll become good friends. Let's find out. And I said I would look up the word intrepid. So that's a big, big word. And you can look up words you don't know on your computer, on your phone, um, on a tablet. And I looked it up on my tablet and here's what intrepid means. It's an adjective, which is a describing word. Adjectives are describing words. And it says intrepid, fearless, adventurous, and used for humorous effect. So when we say someone's intrepid, we say it in a funny way that they're adventurous, that they are courageous, that they have no fear, which kind of describes Zinkoff in some ways, right? So that's what chapter eight was all about, Zinkoff and his new neighbor and his new baby sister. And we learned what intrepid means. And I hope you come back tomorrow. Thanks so much. Hi, if you like this video, please push subscribe at the bottom button below or go to my website, teachthespectrum.com for more resources. My name is Alan Amy. I'm a social emotional learning facilitator here in Los Angeles and look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks so much.